gentlemen, I request all of you to kindly settle down. We're just about to start with today's conference. I humbly request all our delegates to kindly settle down. I would also like to request our speakers, if you haven't yet submitted your presentation, please do so at the console to my right. Are we good to go? Yes. Have you eaten well? No? We've got some lovely refreshments present right here. Please, please help yourself. Uh, so I have been given the green signal to go ahead. I'm going to start by welcoming all of you. A very, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you to the Global Coastal Cities Summit 2023, presented by Mumbai First in collaboration with the European Union, the government of Maharashtra, Consulate of Netherlands and Resilience First. Let me introduce myself. I'm Pooja. I'm going to be a host for the day. I am really excited to be here because climate change is a cause that I personally feel very strongly towards. As we're all aware, now climate change has reached critical levels. There are two factors which have contributed to this kind of change in the climate, natural and man-made. Natural causes, naturally, we do not have control over. However, man-made causes are overutilization of fossil fuel, industrialization, pollution, just naming, I'm just naming a few right now. Uh, and the repercussions, the effects of climate change can be seen in the form of rising temperatures, rising sea levels, land degradation, displacement of people, poverty. Uh, as, as all of you have seen, that uh, climate change not only has effects which are environmental, but they are also socioeconomic in nature. Because with displacement of people comes poverty, comes malnutrition, loss of livelihood. Uh, one of the other factors which has contributed to climate change is the increased agricultural practices and livestock rearing. Yes, there is a global food uh, crisis going on due to which increased agricultural practices are being encouraged. However, we also need to keep into account the fact that it is having a very big impact on climate today. And particularly susceptible to climate today, climate change today are coastlines. Now, coastlines historically have been centers for trade, commerce, for culture. Uh, and most coastal cities have their own abundant natural resources too, which is why they tend to be densely populated. However, what is happening is the reason they are being most susceptible is because of the rising temperatures, the rising sea levels. The threat that today global coastal cities face are flooding, subsidence, soil erosion, apart from the usual, which is uh, displacement of communities, um, there is loss of life, there's loss of livelihood, which happens. There is also uh, malnutrition, which comes into the picture. And also very importantly, there is damage to infrastructure, which takes place. Now let's take, for example, our very own city of Mumbai. I think everybody sitting here will agree that the kind of summer that we have experienced this year, perhaps is one of the hottest summers that Mumbai has ever seen. Am I right? And uh, not just Mumbai, there are other global coastal cities also, like Sydney, like Venice, like Bangkok, like Tokyo, New York, which are facing similar threats. So what this makes us realize is that it is absolutely imperative to safeguard and protect our coastlines, especially these coastal cities. They are the gateway to our country. So what we at Mumbai First intend to do is we believe that now it's not just the responsibility of the United Nations or the environmental bodies or even the governments to take action towards climate change. It is now the responsibility of all the citizens of this planet. We, I don't think we can say that we are citizens of a particular country. We're all citizens of this beautiful planet that has been gifted to us. It is our responsibility to take care of it, not just for ourselves, but also for the future generations. And uh, in that respect, Mumbai First has led a fabulous initiative to create awareness at the most grassroots level so that uh, measures can be taken, proactive and remedial measures can be taken. And what we intend to do in the near future are to conduct a lot more workshops, a lot more seminars, which are going to be making more and more people aware of the impact of the climate change that we're facing. I would also like to add here that uh, through the forum, through this summit that we have uh, gathered here for, we have a distinguished lineup of speakers who are going to be joining us on stage. We have speakers representing the government, private organization, environmental bodies, NGOs, consulates. We have people representing uh, 
science institutes who are going to be sharing their expertise, their knowledge, their case studies with all of us. So I think this is a splendid opportunity for all of us to learn, to share, and uh, to, to be able to come up with uh, pragmatic solutions which can be immediately implemented towards this very, very important cause. So ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I think uh, we're going to be starting. I'm going to only take one moment here to thank our supporters and our partners because an event of this sort is absolutely not possible without their support. Our supporters, Bajaj Foundation, State Bank of India, JSW Group, Godrej and Boys, Concast India, National Stock Exchange. We would also like to thank our knowledge partners, JSW School of Public Policy, Arun Dugal Center for ESG Research, IIM Ahmedabad, PwC, and the Ministry of Mumbai Magic. I'm going to request everybody sitting here to please give a big hand for Mumbai First and all our supporters and partners. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, as we begin, a formal welcome is in order. And uh, we have somebody very special from the European Union who is going to be addressing us. Unfortunately, Sir was not able to make it physically to this event, though he has a recorded, a video recorded message for all of us. Can we have the video on screen, please? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we present to you the Ambassador of European Union to India and Bhutan, His Excellency, Mr. Ugo Astuto. Uh, dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, participate virtually to this Global Coastal Cities um, Summit with you all. In, in this room, we know and we all agree that climate change poses an existential threat for all of us, for mankind as a whole. And we need to act now and act fast unless um, we want to accept the risk of overshooting the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this would have very serious adverse impacts. Extreme weather events, sea level rise, droughts, floods. We see um, uh, this increasing uh, in intensity and frequency all over the world, with Europe or India. So we need to act together. We need to act together now without uh, further delay and we need to cut emissions while at the same time helping uh, the most vulnerable countries um, through adaptation. Project because some of the consequences of climate change are already unfortunately irreversible. The, the European Union uh, has already pledged to become carbon neutral by 2050 and has put in place a very ambitious program of uh, reduction in emissions, the Fit for 55 program, uh, which is about reducing emissions by 55% by 2030. It, it's a major change in the paradigm of our economic growth. And India has also set um, a target for becoming climate neutral and uh, is rolling out very ambitious investment in renewables, solar or green hydrogen. The, the Euro European Union and India uh, can have a very positive influence over the global agenda in, sh in shaping the, 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 the global agenda. Uh, we, we need to work together to make sure that we do implement the commitments taken in Paris. And in order to do so, uh, central governments, but also state governments and local governments have an important role to play. Cities, specifically. Uh, cities are responsible for 70% of global CO2 emissions, with transport, building sites, energy, waste management, all these account for urban greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to create low carbon, sustainable and smart cities. That's why initiatives such as the Global Covenant of Myers on climate and energy are so important. It's, it's a response uh, to climate change coming uh, from the bottom up, from cities around the world. And I'm happy to say that more than 30 cities in India are signatories, including uh, most notably Mumbai. I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the conversation today at this climate solution for coastal cities uh, will, will, will offer an additional contribution to exchange best uh, practices, to raise awareness and find solutions for coastal cities, coastal cities that are particularly vulnerable to the threat of um, 
arise in um, uh, sea levels. So let me conclude here by wishing you all a productive and a successful session. Thank you very much. We would like to thank uh, Mr. Astuto for joining us uh, te uh, telephonically and also for sharing his insight, his message with all of us. And we would also like to express our gratitude to European Union for collaborating with Mumbai First for this summit. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward, our next address is going to be given by Consul General of Netherlands, Mr. Bart De Jong. I request sir to kindly join us on stage. He joined the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment in 1988 and served in various international divisions explaining developments in Dutch water management and coastal defense policies to foreign delegations in Netherlands. He is currently the Consul General of Netherlands in Mumbai. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you, Pooja. And, um... A warm welcome to you all this morning, uh, Ms. Nayar, uh, special welcome to you. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, cooperate with uh, Mumbai First on this uh, very important uh, topic of uh, uh, coastal cities. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a surprise if I tell you that climate change is here. Uh, Ambassador Asuto already mentioned a few examples uh, just uh, in his uh, address. India is going through a period of uh, unprecedented uh, heat and drought. Wildfires are ranging across the world, Australia, Southern Europe, and uh, the west coast of the US. Drought-stricken areas that usually are drought-stricken, Pakistan, Eastern Africa, they're suddenly are confronted with excessive rainfall and floodings. And then hurricanes and cyclones, suddenly they are developing in areas that we never experienced them before. Think about Mumbai, two and three years back, the cyclone just in front of the coast here. And then waterlogging, waterlogging in Asian cities is an ever increasing problem. Look at Mumbai itself, but also Jakarta, Manila. In the Netherlands, uh, we are a country that is for two thirds lying below sea level. Building climate resilient coastal cities is not an option, but it's a bare necessity. The Netherlands has actually uh, been battling uh, sea level rise and uh, river floodings for over a thousand years. And amidst all the doom and gloom talk that we hear nowadays, the good news is actually that you can live below sea level because that's what we've been doing for centuries. All our main cities, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, are all below sea level. But the question is, how did we get there? How did we manage? Firstly, of course, it requires technical solutions. We've built an intricate system of dams, levees, dikes, even movable storm surge barriers. I'll show some examples later on in, uh, in my presentation. But the problem is not longer sea level rise alone. We are now experiencing excessive rainfall in one period, and as I said, also uh, periods of uh, long droughts in the Netherlands. And that is why we are developing structures to absorb and hold excess water within our cities, but also along rivers. So these technical solutions, of course, are very costly. And that is why, secondly, finding solutions to the problem also requires political will. Political will that needs to uh, be uh, across the line between left and right. But thirdly, and I would say actually that is most important, a successful approach requires consultation, cooperation, and co-creation. Cooperation between all stakeholders involved. That firstly is governments, governments on all levels. The central government, that is province in our, uh, uh, in our country, but uh, over here in India at state level. Municipalities, district level, between the municipalities or below the municipalities, I mean. It uh, requires cooperation with knowledge institutes, academia, the civil engineering world, that's where the technical uh, solutions come from. Urban designers and planners, sociologists, real estate developers. And last but not least, it requires cooperation and consultation with local communities, people that actually have a stake in an area, that live in an area. Consultation, cooperation, and co-creation. A public-private partnership between all these stakeholders that I just mentioned. 
This is what the success of the Dutch climate uh, resilience adaptation model is built on. It has been there for a thousand years because it was in everybody's interest to keep their feet dry. We've had that since a thousand years. The rest of the world is experiencing that now. We are here to uh, share, our, share our experiences with you. We brought in three experts uh, that will uh, uh, have the presentations and discussions in the course of the day. And um, we, uh, once again, we are very honored to uh, have the opportunity to, uh, to partner with Mumbai First on this. Um, and we are also looking forward to cooperate with Mumbai, MCGM, Maharashtra to work towards a climate resilient future for coastal cities. I wish you all a very fruitful day and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Jong. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Consulate of Netherlands for supporting and partnering with Mumbai First for this event. Ladies and gentlemen, next uh, I would like to call upon Leader Climate Resilience and Cities PwC, Mr. Nidish Nair. So is going to be setting the context for this conference. To tell you a little bit about our speaker, he is a leader in the field of climate resilience and cities and serves as a driving force behind the cities and resilience practice at PwC India. With a background in architecture and urban planning, he brings with him over 20 years of expertise in promoting urban resilience and sustainable city planning. Please welcome Mr. Nair on stage with a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pujo. A wonderful morning. Uh, Really excited to be here, uh, and, and thank you for uh, you know allowing PwC to partner with Mumbai First on this wonderful occasion. Uh, it's really an honor, and uh, wonderful to hear from the colleagues, Consul General, the uh, you know Ambassador. Uh, really echo uh, the sentiments here. Uh, so when uh, we started discussing with Mumbai First on setting the context for this presentation, and the the idea was really uh, you know how do we take these discussions with Mumbai First on the climate solutions that we're discussing and move it on to a framework for resilience for coastal cities. Uh, you know, that becomes a tangible tool, an idea to work upon that all the cities can uh, then use. And uh, th th so that, that's the idea which we approached with this presentation uh, in terms of resilience framework for coastal cities really. Uh, and what better place than Mumbai uh, to really uh, home to 12 million people and uh, one of the largest cities on the Western coastline uh, to really uh, roll out this uh, discussion on the framework. Uh, the future of uh, future of world economy is largely Asian, and uh, with more than half of the uh, you know people living in the Asian cities, we have enough uh, human power, human capital to really drive this growth. And uh, what comes along with this is also that a lot of carbon emission that we're talking about, more than fifty percent of it, isn't going to be in this side of the world, and hence comes the resultant climate impacts because of that. So while growth happens, there is a resultant climate impact. And uh, also we have biggest victims in terms of the climate impacts of, of, of these. Uh, 99 of the biggest coastal cities across the world are in Asia, which will be have, you know, extreme impacts because of climate uh, impacts, climate results and uh, environmental degradations. Uh, so as a, as a as a globe, when we look at uh, the biggest of the cities, there are several cities across, uh, you know, Ho Chi Minh, Dhaka, Shanghai, Bangkok, all of them. They are all at severe risk in terms of sea level rise over the next, uh, you know, 20 to 30 years, maybe by 2050. Uh, and and the, you know, these are cities which are located among the world's biggest coastline, almost 13, 39,000 miles, which is in Asia. Uh, some of the biggest economies are on these coastline and these are some of the biggest economies there. So any impact to these cities, these coastlines are gonna really impact the, the contribution these cities will have to the global GDP and the global uh, economic growth that is there. Uh, are we ready to cope up with these? Do we, are we ready to uh, you know, uh, look at what needs to be done in terms of making these cities resilient, making these economies resilient over a time? That is something that needs to be worked upon. Uh, as, per, as per recent estimates which came in IPCC, Mumbai alone could have damages to the, uh, to the extent of about 162 billion per year by 2050 just because of sea rise level, sea rise level and the resultant damages. Now, uh, when we're talking about Mumbai, there are several, uh, several of these risks that Mumbai is faced with. Uh, there is flooding, tropical risk, heat waves, 
Uh, all of these really impact. 25% of Mumbai's population is really affected by flooding, severe risk of flooding. Uh, this is 50% of the population lives in informal settlements and out of them 25% are really the ones which are at, at the brunt of it. Uh, there is the, the temperatures we've already mentioned earlier, temperature has really risen in the last two, two and a half, three decades, almost by one degree. That is going to impact the productivity of people, productivity of the labors, most of them informal settlements and people working. Uh, that, that's the impact. Now, when we look at uh, some of the uh, higher vulnerable areas in Mumbai, a uh, lot of these high value assets which we are talking about, iconic landmarks and hubs of economic activity are all going to be affected by the uh, by the sea level rise and the risks because of that uh, over the next uh, up till to around 2050. Uh, what, what we are also seeing that uh, and we've understood is the disproportionate impact that this will have on the vulnerable population, the informal settlements, their ability to work, their ability to stay, their ability to commute uh, and all of that. And that needs to be taken. Businesses are get impacted very highly because these are informal businesses, businesses which are not insured and so on and so forth. And that's the impact that's really coming in. And that's where resilience plays a critical role. So while the city prepares for Mumbai specifically prepares for achieving its net zero plans by 2050, it is extremely important for the city to invest in a invest in resilience, resilience of its systems, uh, its, its coastal ecosystems, its uh, you know economic and social infrastructure, its network infrastructure, you know transportation, power network, telecoms. Uh, invest in building neighborhoods, invest in building people's coping capacity, and so on and so forth. And and that's where uh, that's where this uh, this entire framework comes into play now. Uh, all. Approximately 5 million population, I mean, we've already mentioned this, 5 million population is where what gets affected by this, uh, you know, the severe impacts of climate-induced climate, related, climate disasters. And livelihoods are under severe stress. Uh, when you look at some of these areas, which are really economic hubs of Mumbai, which will get impacted by 2050, it'll affect wages, it'll affect people's ability to earn, and so on and so forth. The, so a lot is uh, really, in terms of action, a lot has been done by the government of Maharashtra, by BMC, in terms of investing in uh, building blocks that contribute to resilience, uh, you know, resilience building. And, and what we're looking at really is projects that have been undertaking investments in drainage, investments in, uh, you know, uh, systems of transportation powers and so on and so forth. Uh, what, what we really look at is a six pillar or a six building blocks for build, uh, resilience and that's what the city really, really needs to invest upon. Uh, starting with uh, environment and natural resources which uh, primarily looks at uh, biodiversity, protection of biodiversity, coastal area, soil erosion, uh, sea level rise, a lot of that aspects. Uh, second is really on interconnected systems, drainage which can help manage inundations and uh, you know retreat and so on and so forth. Uh, protection of public spaces, which can help the cities uh, deal with heat and uh, resultant effects of that, uh, climate land use planning, so climate sensitive land use planning, uh, which is there. Uh, built environment is the third pillar that we really need to invest upon, built environment and infrastructure, uh, looking at building more resilience into the infrastructure design itself, uh, looking at uh, critical assets that are there and the protection of those assets making that available to public as, as public goods in terms of disasters, in terms of other extreme events and so on. Uh, and, and looking at infrastructure damages and insurance costs, how do they really cover, the, cover for that city? Uh, because of frequency of events, the intensity of disasters increasing in the next uh, two to three decades and so on. The fourth pillar is social equity that needs to be invested on, uh, which is the public participation. Council General just emphasized on the points of consultation and building public participation, building people's capacity towards it, uh, building awareness and also investing on health infrastructure systems along with that uh, so that the city speeds up. The fifth pillar is really economy and businesses, helping improve businesses resilience uh, to these uh, events and overall uh, syst city systems uh, and, and looking at uh, livelihoods, you know, how do you secure livelihoods, especially not just during the times of extreme event, but all throughout improving. I mean, there was one data which said almost 200 days in Mumbai are going to be hot days. Uh, in the next decade or so. So how do you really improve uh, the resilience for livelihood uh, in terms of people being able to work and uh, you know earn livelihoods over a longer period of time? And all of these needs to be tied together with a real approach on policy and governance, clear frameworks for bringing all of these together, uh, systems on coastal zone management, interland connectivities, 
uh, planning for economic activities, especially locating them, what kind of activities, so on and so forth, and planning for the urban expansion. Mumbai is, after all, the, the uh, you know, the seven cities which were uh, brought together, seven islands which were brought together. Uh, so that risk always stays. So how do you really plan for urban expansion and taking a, a lot of climate resilience factors into cognizance? Uh, what, what this will add to in the end, uh, and the critical factors that we really look at are considering are uh, how and where we plan and how do we allow the development to happen. That's one factor that we look to. I mean, I'm laying down these four factors because that is gonna be the guiding principles for the next set of sessions that are gonna happen and what we really expect out of these sessions to come out. So there are four guiding factors. How and where do we plan for the development? Uh, the quality of infrastructure that we create, green infrastructure, climate resilient infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Uh, saving our natural flood defense systems. What do we work on that? Communities involvement, uh, you know, coastal communities, especially to be involved in these systems and to deal with coastal erosion and so on and so forth. And finally, dealing with the most vulnerable population, uh, you know, bringing, bringing the equity aspect into the resilience into forefront. These are four aspects that needs to be considered when in the rest of the sessions, when we're dealing with ports, when we're dealing with partnerships, uh, when we're dealing with infrastructure and so on and so forth. And, and uh, really the overarching principle he's here is to look at an interconnected and uh, a more systems kind of approach rather than individual approaches uh, because uh, you know plan and predict models we have worked with earlier have not been working very effectively here. The idea is to build a systems approach, build enough redundancy into the systems, build enough flexibility into municipal systems which are an interconnected set of systems. Uh, and for that, uh, you know, and, and use that as a, as a resilience building framework and approach for the uh, for the city, for coastal systems. Uh, in the next sessions that are there, uh, we would like the audience to really focus upon these core aspects. Uh, three or four things that we would like is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see collaborations from various uh, uh, organizations that are there in terms of taking this framework forward, in terms of working towards a framework for coastal cities. Uh, we will look at learnings in terms of implementing these projects, best practices, technologies, uh, you know, systems, uh, engineering, so on and so forth. The third is looking at a network. How do we develop this into a network that is not just today here, but works towards developing the framework over the next one year, two year, uh, in a more interconnected way. And third is how, how can this be really channelized into catalyzing investments, catalyzing expertise, catalyzing technical know-how, et cetera, in, into the whole process. Uh, that's where I would like to lay the four things, the clear expectations out of how, how we've designed these uh, sessions to come in the next uh, next couple of hours that we hear together. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the support and thank you and really expect this to work out well, uh, you know, and, and continue over the next one year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Nair, for setting the tone for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, next, I would like to call upon climate scientists, Indian Institute of Tro Tropical Meteorology, Dr. Roxy Matthew Call, uh, to tell you a little bit about Sir. He's a climate scientist at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology and is renowned for his groundbreaking contributions to understanding and predicting the Indo-Pacific climate. He has been a lead author for the IPCC reports and former chair of the Indian Ocean Region Panel. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, can we welcome Sir on stage with a round of applause? A very good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I thank Mumbai first for the invite and for organizing this very important discussion and all of you for joining this. Let me get straight into the climate story since it requires urgent attention and Mumbai can't wait. With climate change, the storyline for India's coastline has changed and along with that for Mumbai too. We have crossed 1.1 degrees Celsius in global surface temperature change. And all those extreme weather events in terms of cyclones, heavy rains, 
heat waves that we talk about just now, if you look at the temperature in your Google, you see 33 degrees Celsius for Mumbai, but the field like temperature, 42 degrees Celsius. The increase in humidity with that increase in temperature. Warm air holds more moisture. Mumbai's all coastal cities are close to the sea, so there is more moisture. And warm air holds more moisture, so the impact is like a double warming in terms of high temperatures. Our body can't respond quickly. We have heat strokes and so on. So all these extreme weather events that we see right now is in response to that one degree Celsius change. Now, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, that is the IPCC, with a recent report, what it says is that between 2020 and 2040, that's the current decades, we will cross 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this is, mind you, regardless of the pathways we take, regardless of the carbon emissions that the countries have agreed upon. And two degrees Celsius between 2040 and 2060. This is also regardless of the carbon pathways countries have agreed, up, uh, agreed upon. Which means that, though in the distant future, we have a pathway to keep the temperatures at a flat rate, the extreme weather events that we see now are going to intensify. Now, this is a question that I get. Are these extreme weather events here to stay? I say yes, but also intensify. If you have this many extreme weather events right now, even as a climate scientist, I can imagine the number and severity of extreme weather events with a doubling of temperatures. It can be exponential. But for Mumbai, the climate change and extreme weather events have already manifested what IPCC says in terms of compound events. Now, this is a point that I want to make. Extreme weather events, such as sea level rise, heavy rains, cyclones and their storm surges, these huge waves that cyclones push with a lot of water into the coastline. They're going to overlap. They're already overlapping for cities like Mumbai. We call them compound events. So Mumbai is a perfect example for other global cities also on what is going to happen in other regions as well. And Mumbai can be the best example on how we respond to these challenges. And the first example, probably, because we have all the challenges over here. Let me show you. So here in this map, we see multiple challenges in terms of extreme weather events. On top, the sea level rise. The current sea level rise for the west coast of India is at three millimeter per year or three centimeter per decade. Now this is going to intensify in the near future. The trends are already here to five centimeter per decade. On the east coast it's already five centimeter per decade and it's going to intensify to seven centimeter per decade. In terms of cyclones, our research shows that in the Arabian Sea, the Arabian Sea is warming at a faster rate compared to other seas. Yeah. So there is more heat, there is more moisture for supporting these weather systems. There is a 50% increase in the number of cyclones in the Arabian Sea. And not only the number, but the duration is also intensifying. And this is projected to increase further in the future. And in terms of extreme rains, you see, there is a threefold rise, not just in the coastline of India, but across central India, from the west coast to east coast, different parts, and in the northeast to western guards, central India, and northeast. And this is again going to intensify further. Now there is a puzzling thing here. Along with extreme rains, the total amount of rain that we get is going to decrease, which means there could be a water scarcity issues. The problem is that the same warm air holds more moisture for a longer time 
So it doesn't rain for a long time, but it, when it rains, you get a seasons or a months or a weeks rain in a few hours to a few days by cloud burst. Yeah, that's what is happening. So you can't, that water doesn't spread out in moderate rate and percolate into the groundwater. So water scarcity is another issue. So these, is, these kind of issues are amplifying and heat waves we already talked about. Right. Now, with respect to sea level rise, what does a three centimeter per decade mean? If you consider the slope of the land as well, per decade, it can be 17 meters of land. This basic trigonometry, three centimeter, and you can imagine how much it would be with five centimeter per decade. Now, will, because of this, will Mumbai submerge by 2050? That's one of the questions that I often get. I would say, no, Mumbai won't submerge. But with this compound overlapping of events with heavy rain, storm surges from cyclones and sea level rise, one on top of another, the flooding in the coming years or the coming decades can be prolonged and cover over a large area. That is what we need to address. This is a perfect example of a compound event. So you might have a sea level rise, but huge waves pushing onto our homes. This picture talks volumes. This also shows the unequal scenes. Far ahead, you have the high rises, but down here, you have the water pushing into the houses. And one reason here is that Mumbai is growing as well. Yeah. A lot of domestic migration is happening. This is from this map is from a research, recent research, which shows the domestic migration. From the North End Belt, UP and Bihar, where the agriculture is affected by climate change, people are migrating to mega cities like Mumbai, Vishakhapatnam, Cochin, and so on, Chennai. And there they face new challenges. They don't have a roof. Sorry. They don't have a roof. They don't have a house to stay there. But climate change is not the only culprit here. We change our land. We change our rivers. We change our ecosystems. That also accumulate into the impact. When rivers that are supposed to meander and have flood plains, do not have those flood plains to, for the ground, for the rainwater to percolate, spread out and sink in. It will flood the surrounding regions, compare the top and bottom. So we should not always blame climate change. We can have local adaptation measures in terms of that. Now this shows such a picture. Can you identify the river here? Can you identify the mangroves here? Can you identify the floodplains? This is Mumbai. That line to the middle is supposed to be the Mithi River, exactly. Full points over there. And these blue colored roofs looks colorful, but when a cyclone or a sea level or a floods hit, we don't know if it is a roofs first or the floor first, which is going to be, get washed out, right? So that is the challenge we are looking at. And in terms of cyclones, this study shows that regions close to Mumbai have the least adaptive capacity in terms of housing, in terms of the roof type, roof, roof type vulnerability and wall type vulnerability. Mumbai is at a high risk. That is what we have to target. And how do we target? And what do we target? Along with climate change and local land use changes, one of the important factor is population. So we talked about the current temperature change, one degree Celsius. By the time we are at two degrees Celsius, which is not far away, our population will be doubling from 20 million for the larger Mumbai, our population will be doubling to 40 million. So that is like one Mumbai on top of another Mumbai. We need the infrastructure, we need the housing, we need the roads, yeah? 
So if we need to do that, we need to think about the future changes. We need to think about the ecosystem and develop. The IPCC shows multiple ways on how we can work on our coastline. There are multiple ways, accommodating ways. So one of the best suggested solution is accommodation along with ecosystem adaptation. That's, that's one of the ways that Mumbai can go forward. But here, urban scaping and architecture is quite an important factor to consider if we want to go forward with ecosystem adaptation. That has to be integrated while that Mumbai expands to that double, double the population. And we require urgently to involve the community. This is just one example how communities can be involved in terms of monitoring and working on coastal erosion and sea level rise. So you just have a frame to put your camera and take photos, upload it through an app, yeah? And that can show you, like this video, the changing coast, coast side. I have worked with several community initiatives like this, with schools and educational institutions in terms of monitoring the weather, monitoring rain. Schools are installing rain gauges and they are growing up with the awareness of how the rain is changing, how the coastline is changing, how the rivers are changing. But this can be scaled up. This needs to be scaled up, community involvement. So the private sector, public sector, scientists, educational institutions, NGOs, we need to work together. Like Pooja said in the beginning, it's not the job of governments alone. We all need to work together on this. And that can help us to build a resilient Mumbai for the future. This is not a picture of Mumbai, but Boston in the US. They have a plan for 2070. Based on future projections of sea level changes, based on future projections of extreme weather events, we need a concrete plan for not just our generation, for, but for the generations to come. So that by 2070, we know what are the challenges and how can Mumbai expand? By 2070, by 2050 itself, our population will be doubled. 2070, it might get flattened or it might go up. But we have more challenges to face. And the flood lines and the flood maps and the plains will be totally different. So we need to mark them out and have that ecosystem-based adaptation over here. So the climate is changing, so must Mumbai in terms of sea level rise. We need to redesign the city for sea level rise and floods, cyclonic winds. We need to have sustainable water management. A lot of water comes from the nearby regions and water scarcity is a big issue there. Like I said, the total amount of rainfall is going down while extreme rains are going up. And we need to work on ecosystem-based adaptation that can help both extreme temperatures, cyclonic winds, and sea level rise and floods. And we have to work together. Thanks a lot. Thank you. On behalf of uh, Mumbai First, I would like to thank Dr. Cole for sharing his research and his insights with all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, as our next speaker for this inaugural session, I would now like to welcome on stage Chairman Mumbai First, Mr. Narendra Nair. He is the visionary founder and chief executive of Concast India and the driving force behind the Mumbai First, a think tank dedicated to making Mumbai a better place to live, work, and invest in. Please welcome Sir on stage with a round of applause.
Ladies and gentlemen, on my own behalf and on behalf of Mumbai First, may I extend you all a very, very warm welcome. We were expecting His Excellency the Governor and the Chief Minister, but we are told they are delayed or may not be able to make it today. So I am therefore addressing in their, in their absence. And uh, also, uh, Mr. Sirinivas, is, is he here? I don't know. He's also the chairman of the um, MMRD Commissioner, but he's not, but Mr. Deshpande is here. But in Mr. Uh, Srinivas's absence, Mr. Deshpande, I'd like you to congratulate Mr. Srinivas for the excellent work he's done in completing the MTH uh, Trans Harbor Link. This will really open up great opportunities for Mumbai in, in hinterland. Thank you, Bart, for excellent presentation and for your very kind and cooperation with us all the last few years and for this conference and really look forward to working with you and your consulate and your government in years to come. We have a big agenda as coming up, so we'll take it forward with your help. Ladies and gentlemen, we firmly believe that the newest and the greatest challenge of our era is environmental degradation. Since the Stern Committee report in 2006, climate change has become the single largest threat to mankind in a very short period of time. Having overtaken all predictive scenarios, the term climate emergency is more appropriate to describe the times that we live in. I'm reminded of the words of Prince Charles, now King Charles, who said in 2013 that ignoring climate change is turning the world into a dying patient. Later in 2019, addressing the world leaders in London, King Charles reiterated that he is firmly of the view that the next few years will decide our ability to keep climate change to survivable levels and to restore the nature to equilibrium we need to, for our survival. The Stern Committee report in 2006 and the various subsequent international studies continue to remind us that sea water levels will continue to rise and we have been also reminded this morning in the 21st century in several coastal cities like Bangkok, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Bangladesh, Jakarta, and others will be vulnerable to sea water temperature rises. And apart from affecting the lives of millions of people, assets worth many trillions of dollars could be exposed to coastal flooding. I've been following with great interest COP26 and COP27. These conferences were supposed to put the world on a 1.5 degree course pathway, but have we succeeded is a big question. I do however believe the conferences delivered important successes, but failed short of expectations. The important thing in my view is the leaders from around the world gathered at COP26 and 2027 acknowledge the challenges that we face from climate change and that something needs to be done now and not tomorrow. We should understand the imperative and the desperation of crisis. Every breath we take is toxic. Not long ago, Mumbai had the distinction of being the most polluted city in the world. We must realize that we have a crisis on our hand and that we need to do something. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very concerned about the future of our city. And particularly the challenges we are likely to face due to climatic change. The floods in 2005 in Mumbai should have been a wake of call. Now 
We will again remind you today, extreme day, heat day, we are reinforced, floods are more likely than ever before to be part of the life of Mumbai because the Mumbai mountain monsoon pattern has changed. There are more rainfall days now than 10 years ago. Mumbai could be underwater as we've been reminded again this morning, a little while ago, by 2050, if sea waters continue to rise. The recent shine shows the challenges are more severe than what we imagined. Mitigation of the impact of climate change requires serious and urgent effort at all levels. In our Silver Jubilee year, Mumbai first, we identified climate action as one of our core themes and we organized with the support of the government of Maharashtra, European Union, amongst others, two international conferences on climate crisis. In continuation of this initiative, we are organizing our conference today dealing with threats to coastal cities face. During India's presidency of G20, the key focus is climate change and sustainable development, including social economic issues and the, at the nexus of sustainable development goals. Mumbai truly represents the challenges coastal cities face due to climate disasters. And our conference attempts to cover the issues involved. It should also be noted that this is the only major event dealing with urban issues under during G20 presidency in Mumbai. You will see from the program that we have some national and international experts. And following deliberation today, we will urge the authorities that we need to take coastal vulnerability seriously and we cannot continue with short-term measure measures. On our part, I want to commit that starting with the conference today, climate action agenda will be taken up seriously in a mission more by Mumbai first. Following today's deliberation, where national and international experts will share their perceptions on this very important and subject and determine what proactive steps need to be taken to take to deal with challenges that we face. We will work hand in hand with the government, business leaders, industry, and citizens to achieve this. Before I take before I conclude, I want to take this opportunity of having such a large gathering here to mention our, our journey in Mumbai first. So nearly a decade ago, together with McKinsey, we then a study to show how Mumbai could be transformed into a world-class city. And following that study, a lot of um, vision Mumbai document was prepared and a lot of pro infrastructure projects that are now under implementation are part of that program. Ladies and gentlemen, when we commenced our journey, we had no illusion that our task was going to be easy. But as we progress, we realize that there are many challenges and opportunities too. The biggest challenge, in my view, is a single point accountability. Within the present governance system, there are 17 agencies involved in planning and execution of projects in Mumbai. All these agencies are led by very competent managers. In other words, we have an excellent orchestra, an excellent player, but no director. Ideally, we should have elected mayor, but that is not going to be possible easily. And the next best solution is to have a single point accountability. It could be um, a CEO or administrator. What you call him doesn't matter as long as he is accountable and he works out of the chief minister's office with full responsibility. I'd like to thank all the participants and speakers today who have traveled not only from within India, but from a, across the world. I'm grateful to them for sparing the time to come and share their views with us today.
Before I conclude, I would like, also like to express my gratitude and appreciation for the support and encouragement we have received during our journey over the two decades and continue to receive from the various organizations, amongst others, the government of Maharashtra, government of India, World Bank, European Union, and our friends, the Northern Consulate and other consulates. Thank you very much, Mark. Mackenzie worked with us to prepare Vision for My document, and we're now grateful to Price Waterhouse for the presentation today and for the work they've done with us in, in the recent years. I would like to end on a personal note. I had the honor and privilege of heading this wonderful organization for some years, and it's been a wonderful experience for me. I also had the pleasure of working with five chief ministers and equal number of chief secretaries and commissioners. I'm grateful to them for their guidance and encouragement. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our patron members, my governing board colleagues, and all others for their support and their continued support. It has been an amazing journey over the last two decades. I believe the seeds have been sown, and I strongly believe that we and the city will reap benefit as we go along. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Nair for joining us on stage and for addressing the audience. It is his wavering commitment to the city that makes him a true visionary in shaping Mumbai's future. Can we hear it for Mr. Nair once again? Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome upon stage Member Administration Capacity Building Commission, CEO Mitra, Shri Praveen Pardeshi. Before I welcome sir to the dais, there's a little bit that I would like to share with all of you about sir. He comes with over 38 years of experience in the Indian Administrative Services, the UN and the UNDP. He has served in various senior executive roles in the past as well as the Municipal Commissioner of Mumbai. He has managed the entire public health structure of Mumbai, a city with 18 million inhabitants. He also created and led the task force for COVID-19 containment while also implementing WHO and government guidelines. Along with his work in the IAS, he has held senior leadership positions in the United Nations as the head, global head of post-crisis recovery cluster UNDP Geneva and senior coordinator of UNISDR. Recently, he has been appointed as the CEO of Mitra, the state's think tank set up recently on the lines of Niti Aayog. Let's welcome Sir on stage with a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, it's indeed a very important uh, meeting and it's a uh, great pleasure to speak uh, to all of you. Uh, so one thing I'll try to start with is try to turn everything upside down. I heard the uh, talk at the beginning from the Indian uh, Tropical Institute. And uh, the first important thing is I think that climate change is not a threat. It's the greatest opportunity for Mumbai to transform itself into an equitable and uh, livable city so uh, and that's what how the world has moved it has moved not on uh, advantages it's only moved on what are its biggest disadvantages so uh, whatever problems mumbai faces uh, basically climate change is the one way which will enable us to uh, convert those disadvantages into something good so let's start with the some of these models, which I think uh, Dr. Roxy has already uh, shown us, and the areas which will be inundated are areas which are near the creek, uh, creeks or low-lying areas. And uh, some of the things which uh, Supriya, uh, who's our, uh, one of our facilitators, uh, explained in the model that places like Miti River, etc., are going to be the places. But who lives out here? Uh, if you see most of these wards, which are li likely to be inundated most, it's people, 50% uh, of Mumbaikas live 
in this uh, in this way. So climate change is the biggest opportunity to uh, make homes for all of them at the cost of all of us sitting in this room because all of us have resisted expanding FSI vertically because we want to live Mumbai in a more self-contained space rather than accommodating these people next to us. So climate change will enable us to go vertical all along the uh, corridors because we don't have land. Uh, whatever we might say, we don't have land for allowing mangroves, forests, etc. to come back where they already disappeared. There's no more land there. Mumbai, for example, has 70% in its development plan as non-buildable area. It's forests and creeks. So Mumbai is settled in just 30% of its city size. So though we are more than 400 square kilometers, only 30% is developable land, which is good. And one of the things that we can do with this is look at what are private open spaces. So most of our uh, town planning, Mr. Bimal Patel showed us, is that a city like Mumbai is mostly like a wasteland, not because it's a wasteland in terms of, uh, you know, people can't live here, but because town planning norms have imposed a very elitist consideration where buildings, for example, along the Marine Drive have small open spaces all around them, which are useful to nobody except for the amount of personal comfort that people rich people living out there get at the cost of those people who are living in slums on on the river banks so most cities have changed this they have collapsed all private open spaces and converted them into buildable vertical areas and expanded public usable spaces which are streets and footpaths and not enclosed small footprints so if you'll see a shocking thing about uh, Mumbai or other, most other uh, Indian cities is that public spaces, uh, the building footprints in Mumbai are just around 20-25%. Uh, and uh, the uh, public open spaces are hardly 20-25%, uh, which includes streets. While in cities which have learned to live, including from our colleagues, uh, a country which lives almost completely under the sea level and therefore shows us how we can live in future. Uh, we can convert a lot of the private open spaces into homes uh, for the poor only by allowing non-intervention in things like FSI to grow up for slum redevelopment. So that's my first point. And where, where will this happen? So this will happen, can happen all along the metro corridors, which are quite safe. So that's the biggest thing which Mumbai first has contributed and also the government, the previous government. Uh, led by Mr. Fadnavis contributed that for 30 years we were talking about metro, but uh, that government started construction of the largest metro network in the world. It's underway and that metro network along with high FSI on both sides can ensure densification, ensure residential spaces are close to places of work so that people don't have to travel too much and people don't have to live in Mithi River and uh, such like because we want our FSI 1.5 uh, to enjoy our comfort spaces. So this is my first point that it, the, the impending climate change is an opportunity to provide homes for all the 50% of our people who live in slums, in flat structures, along riverbeds, along sea coast, uh, in a highly densified structure, uh, which is like the transport oriented or corridor oriented uh, development. Uh, which can go vertical, but the vertical thing looks bad, but it's good because it enables concentration of energy uh, provision, on minimization of transportation, which is a CO2 uh, generating uh, thing, and concentration of water provision, and concentration of sewage treatment. If we allow Mumbai to grow outwards, there is no sewage treatment. Providing water out there is very high cost. It's very carbon intensive. So my second thing is, again, false controversy, uninformed uh, discussions about Mumbai. So that's the second big problem. You see, we all think that, oh, everyone, I used to be municipal commissioner here, Mr. Velarusu, additional commissioner, he's done one of the uh, great jobs which I'm going to talk about. Uh, 
there are so many uh, interest groups which are talking about a single tree being cut in Mumbai. And they stop everything, including construction of underground drainage to take away storm waters. They delayed uh, the construction of metro, which is the only answer for uh, tomorrow's problems uh, because of a few thousand trees being cut. But despite all of that, Mumbai has the highest number of trees in the world for any city. That's mostly because uh, just, it's mostly because of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park and the non-buildable areas. And the trees per person per square kilometer are the highest in any. But the, so therefore, Mumbai could have been the cleanest city, isn't it? So this is where Mumbai figures in terms of pollution. Despite having the highest number of trees, it's only next to Beijing in terms of particulate matters. So the culprit and the solution is not the trees. The issue is about personal vehicular growth. So no other city, neither Amsterdam nor London, have so many private car increase per day as Mumbai has. So whatever you do, how many trees you plant, if you plant the whole sea, get all the mangroves back, you can't counter the type of particulate pollution which this type of personal vehicular growth involves. The only answer to this is not more trees. Sorry, there's no space. The only answer is public transport. What does public transport do? Public transport ensures that we have the lowest CO2 emissions per passenger kilometer on a bus compared to vehicular uh, transport. So uh, what we had done when I was municipal commissioner, we decreased the prices of uh, buses, more than doubled the passenger traffic on buses and made bus traffic a little bit more comfortable by using IT solutions where you can predict when the bus is going to reach the bus stop or when how long it's going to take to go to the next. All of these things do far more to reduce carbon emissions and adapt to the future than looking at conventional solutions. So this is the third thing I want to come at, which is that every problem that you face, think of it as an opportunity because the disadvantages are the only thing which are real. Uh, most of the advantages are hyped and they're not real. So you can't build on your advantages. You can build only on your disadvantages. This is what we did with the ITMS. Now we have the, I don't know whether so how is this uh, working now that we can predict. Uh, yeah, so this is something that we can do. So now we'll come to two other challenges with Dr. Roxy mentioned. One was about the water. I, there are a lot of issues which we can talk about, but water is something which is really significant. So, you know, what Mumbai has been doing, Mumbai is like all of us sitting in this room, a very elite city. So for, from 400, uh, sorry, sorry, from 125 to 100 kilometers away, we take everybody's water and bring it to Mumbai. And as our population increases, we want to do more of it. We are going to build more dams. But we don't need to, because what uh, climate change tells us, we don't absolutely need to build any more new dams. We have enough water if we can recycle uh, the wastewater. So that's what Mr. Velarasu did after a long amount of public interest litigations, which people went to court by saying how much this BOD should be or COD should be. And that's why I delayed the construction of sewage treatment plants. Uh, the actual construction has now started, which will ensure that I'll just uh, can we uh, use the screen? Uh, uh, because I can't do it from here. Uh, who, who have, who's managed here? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Sandeep Gaware. BMC me sub engineer hai. Kaam inke liye khali kaam nahi hai. The water comes more than 120 inke kilometers. Beti ki birthday party chhod kar plant par chale gaye. Ye main hu. Mrs. Gaware. Katera katera bhare teri khushiyon ka dariya. Ye kehte hai. Non-stop Mumbai ko paani bhi non-stop milna chahiye. Haske kaam karte rehte hai. Taki puri Mumbai ko nal kholte hi saaf paani mile. Yaas bujhau chahe jo bhi ho zariya. Is safar mein bund bund badhta rahe to. Hero hai. Water hero. Chalta rahe tu, behta rahe tu, chalta. In ki tarah, Mumbai ko saaf paani pahunchate rehne ke liye, BMC ke 30,000 karamchari jute rehte hai. 
तो आप भी पानी बचाएं और अगर आपको पानी की चोरी का पता चले तो प्लीज इसकी खबर बीएमसी को दें सो बेसिकली व्हाट आई वांटेड टू से दिस इज हाउ वी गेट वाटर नाउ and if we think incrementally that this is how we are going to get it in future we won't get it like that because we need to build more dams and whatever bmc does it's not going to be enough because tribal people are already resisting construction of dams uh, upstream because it's their water so we don't need to do all of that because there is so much of uh, waste water which we are not treating if we treat that water we get the whole amount of water supply that we are getting from tansa dam back so this is the second solution that is you recycle the waste water and at least start with the bulk users we already started with some of the chemical uh, fertilizer factories to give them uh, treated waste water but we can do this much more with rather than building dams uh, these are the uh, treatment plants which again with lot of public interest litigation were delayed for 10 years but i think mr velaros who started most of them uh, the construction has started so this will give us as you can see the number it can give us more than uh, 2000 mld of uh, treated water so no new dam can give that sort of water in situ that is in mumbai uh, i'll end this my talk with the climate change so you know climate change also has an impact on uh, viral disease load and as temperatures change so we are going to face more and more of viruses so again instead of attacking the problem directly uh, we need to look what is underlying this issue so underlying covid is not covid at all so what we found uh, you know when mr thakre transferred me so i had an opportunity to work at uh, the global uh, uh, un and look at how non communicable diseases are affecting covid and this is very interesting so countries which have very if you see singapore it has the lowest mortality due to non communicable diseases like heart attacks or uh, um, uh, cancer or uh, diabetes so even if they the whole population went through covid their covid mortality rate is hardly anything and on the other end you have countries like pakistan indonesia which have very high non communicable disease burden and therefore the covid mortality is also very high per 100 cases or 1000 cases india is somewhere in between mumbai is a little bit higher because we have very high non communicable disease burden even in uh, slums so the way to look at the next viral epidemic is not to attack it because we don't know what virus is going to come and when the vaccination will come but to look at the current problem the current problem is high high levels of diabetes high levels of lifestyle diseases and if we can counter all of them this is a calculation that we did uh, when i was in the un and what we found that if a country with 60 million and 6 uh, 6 million infected people it can have 144000 deaths if the non communicable disease burden is very high which is 5 per 1000 but as the non communicable disease control goes down the number of deaths come down from any viral load and finally you have a country like singapore which with same number of people infected has hardly any deaths if the non communicable disease burden comes down so for mumbai on the health front instead of being scared of the next viral infect we can start right now looking at in the slum areas when we started testing in slum areas we find that most of the people who are dying in mumbai of covid were not dying really of covid they were dying of diabetes or they were dying of uh, high blood pressure which was overloaded on covid so covid will come and go but we can tackle this problem today by uh, detecting it and solving it uh, forever and my last issue is about tomorrow's problems so uh, see today's technologies are barely enough to solve today's problems so if we try to project today's solutions and today's uh, technologies into tomorrow's problems we will be finished so talking you know we all know mangroves maharashtra has been the state which has increased mangrove Uh, under uh, forest cover, maximum mangrove increase has happened. That's not going to solve the problem of flooding in 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 Mumbai. The only way to solve flooding problem is not by any conventional technologies. It's by doing what Japan has already done, which is to take whole rivers and all this surplus water underground. And we can do it in Mumbai because there is no other space. So I'll end out here with the thing that we need to think of tomorrow's problems in terms of forthcoming technologies and not resist them. If we resist them, we'll get caught in uh, forever. and will not convert climate change into a big opportunity that it is thank you
On behalf of all of us here, I would like to thank Mr. Pardeshi for taking time out and joining us here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we conclude the inaugural session, it's time for the vote of thanks. I request Vice Chairman Mumbai First, Mr. Ashang Desai, to please join us on stage. Good morning. <clears throat> I think I have a easiest job compared to all the heavy lifting done by our speakers earlier. <clears throat> but uh, it's great to be here uh, again uh, as Mumbai First Vice Chairman on this Global Coastal Cities uh, Summit. It is a problem that I'm very proud we focused on much earlier than many other stakeholders and, uh, and, 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 and raised it at a level of awareness, even at a government level, I can say that. So I feel very good that we have been, we have been very effective uh, think tank or a catalyst for the Mumbai, which we have been for last 25 years as Mr. Nair talked about. But this new problem and new opportunity, Mr. Pardesi would say, is, is something that we need to look at extremely carefully and as, as, as a catalyst for the city of Mumbai, I'm proud that we have this today. I'll, I'll focus on, of course, inaugural session uh, as far as I'm concerned here. So uh, before anything else, I think I, need, I must thank uh, government of Maharashtra, European Union and uh, Netherland, uh, Kingdom of Netherland and Consulate and uh, others who supported this event or have, have been active participants and uh, catalyst for this event. Coming to the speakers, I think Mr. Astuto, of course, opened up the session with a Global Outlook. I think one, one thing which is coming up here, if you look at this inaugural session, is this problem of uh, environment at a larger level, but to be very focused on global coastal cities, is a systemic problem. And systemic problem requires systemic solutions, which can only be done through partnership, because one stakeholder cannot solve it. So one message which flows through this whole uh, inaugural session is the systemic uh, issue. So it is very nice to see Mr. Astuto talking at a global level participation to make that happen. Uh, and European Union, of course, has been always supported to Mumbai first. So thanks to them. Uh, Mr. Bart De Jong, of course, has been very supportive. Uh, Netherlands, per se, has been very participative with our effort uh, of Mumbai first for the last many years. And uh, again, they are here. So thanks. Uh, Mr. Jong for uh, your uh, input and talking about Netherlands, which has been an example of what to do with the, uh, you know, large mass underwater, under sea level, sorry. And thanks for getting people uh, also who are going to speak later. So thanks to Netherlands. Uh, theme presentation, of course, was PwC. Thanks. I thank PwC for participating and being a knowledge partner for this. And he did talk about those six issues, I think, which are, again, a systemic issues about governance, integrated planning, build, uh, social equity, economy, business, uh, etc. I think it, 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 it's, a, it's a highlight, again, opening up our eyes to look at it as a systemic problem. So thanks, uh, Nitish, for uh, your inputs. Then we have, of course, Dr. Roxy Matthew Call uh, from uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology. Thanks for uh, starting saying that it is an opportunity and, uh, and, and, and redesigning the city. Some of the things that you presented were really indeed data-driven in terms of rise of water and what it means to redesign the city is something, uh, you know, which, which, which is an action that government has to, of course, look at it, but more importantly, community. 
So localized action was your message. Thanks for that. We, of course, had uh, Narendra later talking about uh, our overall feel, uh, our overall uh, Mumbai first and what we do, and ended up with uh, Mr. Pardesi giving really uh, what I would call um, data driven and very, very scientific approach and upsetting maybe some of the our counterintuitive solutions like high FSI. There are people who, of course, have some other view on FSI, but if one goes behind, he opened up our eyes what it means to see this as a solution to the problem. He talked about, of course, private open spaces and how they are affecting our uh, space available for the uh, residential and uh, public spaces. Public transport, of course, is uh, well known, but the way he kind of show, showed to us what it means is more striking. Generally, it is known that buses are better, but making it happen and being it data driven is something that I really uh, feel very inspiring in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of approach. And then, of course, a very interesting data on NCD versus uh, death. Uh, in, in, in COVID, uh, it was something, of course, we were not aware, I'm sure. So all in all, I think we end this introductory session with a feel of problem at the same time, feel of the opportunity, as I would call it. Opportunity to make things happen, opportunity to have a make difference. And more importantly, I think it is an opportunity for uh, at, at an economic opportunity, at a business opportunity for the leaders, business leaders around here. So I think probably solving the cities require some looking behind rather than moving forward at one level, as they say. There is so much to look behind and see the opportunities that can be addressed to solve this problem is a message that I take. Of course, it's time to thank uh, all our sponsors like Bajaj, SBI, Godrej, uh, uh, GSW, NAC, and uh, Mr. Narendra Nair's company itself. Uh, knowledge partners, of course, BWC, IIMA, uh, and uh, School of Public Policy of IIMA, and uh, Arun Dugal Center, and Ministry of Mumbai, Mumbai's Magic. These are supporters, so I thank all of them and really looking forward to the whole day now. I think having started it uh, with this, this level of, uh, what should I say, this level of uh, analysis and this level of uh, inspiration, I'm really looking forward to the whole day. And I hope you will, all of you, thank all of you for coming here uh, and hoping that all of you will be with us throughout the day. Uh, and thanks for all our Mumbai First Secretary, who has made this happen, of course, and the uh, Board of Governors. Thank you. I thank Mr. Desai for giving the vote of thanks. So may I request you to please join me back on stage. We would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the remarkable speakers who have contributed their expertise and insights to this session. I request our uh, Inauguration session speakers to please join us on stage. Requesting Mr. Bad Dijong, Mr. Nidish Nair, Dr. Rothri, Roxy Matthew Call, Sri Praveen Pardesi ji to please join us on stage. I request Mr. Desai to kindly present a token of our appreciation to our esteemed speakers. I also request Mr. Narendra Nair to please join us for a group photograph.
for these mementos, we have partnered with the Ministry of Mumbai Magic, a citywide progressive youth climate community that believes that young people are not just the face of Mumbai's future, but are equal stakeholders of its present. This community is incubated at the Purpose Climate Lab in India. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our inaugural session speakers a big hand. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on stage.